Hi guys, Dane here, and today I've got something super cool. So, if you haven't come across her channel yet, there is a booktuber called Hannah Tay, who I suggest you check out. And she has an Etsy shop where she does various handmade bits and bobs and that kind of stuff. But one of the items that she has is kind of a mystery book, and it's her favourite book. So, I'm not sure whether everybody gets the same package, and if so, I may be ruining the mystery here and forcing her to change it up a bit. But I thought it'd be interesting to buy this mystery book from her Etsy shop and see what it is, read it and review it and do all of that in one sort of big old video. So the only problem with that is that it arrived today and I didn't realise what it was so I already kind of opened it. I opened it enough to figure out what it was and then I was like shit I'm supposed to be uh, filming this for a video. So there is actually, I was videoing it as part of just my general haul so there is some footage but it includes a very baffled me trying to figure out what's going on let's have a look at that footage i got a thing i got a thing hey look at this they sent me this and uh, there's my address uh, um this this is a um, special delivery this has come from with a handwritten label and i have no idea who sent it to me but we'll we'll uh can't get in scissors all right uh. Jesus Christ. Let me in! Ow! Ow! I've got a fucking paper cut! Ow! Ah, this is going horribly wrong! Oh, I know what this is! Oh, okay, so, um, so... Oh, I was going to do a full intro and outro to this. So basically, uh, Hannah Tate on YouTube has got a thing on Etsy where you can buy a copy of her favourite book and it's all mysterious and whatnot. So this is what I've got. So my plan for this, this has totally thrown me off because I'd forgotten this was even coming and I just assumed I would recognise it when I got here. So I guess I'll top and tail this footage with some sort of intro where I know what I'm doing. Then we'll have this footage and then I'll read it and then there'll be the review. So that's probably what you're watching. Okay, so that brings us up to date. So I've got these like a couple of little packages and there's a note here as well, which I'm going to read the note out to you. And it comes on this nice little pink paper with a cat on it, obviously. Is that Sabrina? No, I don't think it is Sabrina. All right, let's read this out. Hello, Dane. This book will not only pull on your heartstrings, it will cut them to shreds. Thank you, Hannah. It's about a young, naive girl called Great, who at 16 has to become a maid to the famous painter Johannes Vermeer and his family. That's pretty cool. Vermeer is an odd man who gets Great to model for him in secret so that his jealous, unloved wife doesn't find out. The author of this brilliant novel is Tracy Chevalier, who writes historical fiction, and this to me is her best work. When you turn over the last page of this beautiful creation, you will feel as if you could have gone on for another thousand pages. Great will both delight and haunt you, and for me has lived on in my memory for many years. I hope you love this book as much as I do, Hannah Tay. Cool. Cool, because I don't read a huge amount of historical fiction, but I'm I'm not against it, if that makes sense. Like, I, I think the authors, because I tend to read the same authors quite a lot, and I guess you either write historical fiction or you don't kind of thing. But I kind of have been meaning to read more historical fiction. I've just been, I guess, waiting for the right book. So, so hopefully, this book will be that. I'm going to open this, because I don't know what this is as well. This is cool. Let's have a look. Oh, it's some tea! Jasmine. Jasmine Deli tea, I imagine. Yeah. Alright, let's have a look at the book. Oh, look at that! Girl with a pearl earring. Okay, I have actually heard of this. Oh, she's written in it as well. So she's written, To Dane, I hope you love this book as much as I do. Hannah Tay. I'm just looking at it and... Um, you know, I really like this edition as well. Like, if you look at the print size and stuff, it's not too, um, it's not too dense. The actual holding this book in my hands, it almost feels like, um, you know, you know, when you pick up like a mass market thriller or something like that, and you look at it and you know that you're just gonna whiz through it because the the print's a decent size. It's not a massive book. It does have a blurb on the back from the Daily Mail, unfortunately, so that scores points against it. But it's got Time and the Guardian on it as well. Guardian called it a truly magical experience. Let's read the blurb. Those eyes are fixed on someone, but who? What is she thinking as she stares out from one of the world's best loved paintings? 
Johannes Vermeer can spot exceptional beauty when Grit, penniless daughter of a tile maker, catches his eye. He draws her into his world where she moves from servant to student and muse. Then she covers her head in blue and yellow cloth and wears a pearl for a morning. The result is explosive. I actually really like the fact that it's um, got this art connection as well. So The Girl with the Pearl Earring is an international bestseller and was long listed for the Orange Prize in 2000. All right. All right, I'm down with this. I'm quite happy with this. I must admit, I I didn't know what to what book to expect, and in many ways, I didn't care. I kind of I, I didn't I didn't want to think about it in advance and think, oh, which one might I get? So um, so I didn't try and you know decipher any clues or anything like that. And I'm I'm very happy with this actually. And as well, this I think this isn't the kind of book that I would necessarily go out and pick up, but it's one that I can get very much on board with reading. So. I'm looking forward to it. What's going to happen is I'm going to go off and read this. Uh, when when will I read this? What am I reading at the moment? I'm currently reading. Oh, in fact, I'm current. Oh, it's through there. I'm currently reading a book called Hindu Sex Aliens by uh, a friend of mine. So I'm going to read that, and then I might I might move on to this next. I think this might be what I go for next. So anyway, I will come back at you on another day when I finish reading this book, and I will let you know what I thought of it. All right, well, I have news. I have finished reading Girl with the Pearl Earring. I've also tried to learn how to pronounce the character's name. I googled it and apparently it's something like Greet. But that just sounds like I'm clearing my throat, so I might just call her Greet. I really enjoyed this. It, I mean, my expectations were kind of high, I guess, because I was quite excited to go in and read it. And it definitely lived up to what I was hoping for. I'm going to go through and uh, check out some of my different notes that I made as I went through. And then I'm going to give it my rating at the end. So let's check it out. So as I guess I mentioned already when uh, reading Hannah's little letter about this, basically Greet goes to work with uh, Johannes Vermeer. Can we just can we just call him Greet and Johan? Greet goes to work for him, and um, basically the reason she's chosen specifically to go and work for uh, for Vermeer is because he wants somebody to be able to clean his studio without moving stuff, or if they do move stuff, it needs to go back to where it is. And uh, Greet's father is a tile maker, but unfortunately he's gone blind, and so she's kind of learned the skill she needs to to clean the studio by looking for her father because she knows she has to put things back when she cleans for her father because otherwise he can't find them, he's blind. That's just the first of many different things throughout this book that's just, uh, the details that are included are phenomenal like to the point where the imagination of Tracy Chevalier is insane. So for example, there's a point where it says here, uh, I favored a white cap that folded in a wide brim around my face, covering my hair completely and hanging down in points on each side of my face so that from the side, my expression was hidden. I kept the cap stiff by boiling it with potato peelings. And just that fact, that little tiny bit of detail makes this feel so much more believable, especially for a, a historical fiction novel. And I just think it's great. I think there are so many examples of that throughout this book and I could be here all day if I went to try and pick them all out. It's cool as well, it's set in uh, Delft in the Netherlands and that's where Delftware comes from. And if you don't know what Delftware is, I'm gonna treat you to some Google Home action. Hey Google, what's Delftware? According to Wikipedia, Delftware or Delft pottery, also known as Delft blue, is blue and white pottery made in and around Delft in the Netherlands and the tin glazed pottery made in the Netherlands from the 16th century. Thank you very much Google. There are some great bits as well because obviously she goes to live with Vermeer and gets used to living this different life and then when she does go back to visit her family it's somehow strange, she's not used to it. And a great example of this contrast between the old and new is shown here. When we ate dinner, I tried not to compare it with that in the house at Papist Corner, but already I had become accustomed to meat and good rye bread. Although my mother was a better cook than Taneka, the brown bread was dry, the vegetable stew tasteless with no fat to flavour it. The room too was different. No marble tiles, no thick silk curtains, no toiled leather chairs. Everything was simple and clean, without ornamentation. I loved it because I knew it. 
but I was aware now of its dullness. What's pretty cool about this as well is because of the time period it's set in, it's set sort of 1664 to 1666, I think, and then there's a bit afterwards at the end. Um, but because of the time period, the, uh, the plague is taking place, as in the Black Death, and... Um, I don't want to give too much away about how it actually impacts the storyline, but you get to see things like entire areas of the city being shut down and this kind of stuff, and people not really knowing, you know, how to respond to it, because at the time they didn't know what was causing it. So there's some great bits as well that just capture human nature. So there's a, a point where she asks a soldier for information, and he says, I could ask around, but not for nothing. And it says, but he did not seem ashamed. I had forgotten that soldiers think of just one thing when they see a young woman. There was one thing that seemed a little bit anachronistic, and that was that one of the characters says this about a pregnant woman. She says, he says, she's made to have babies, pops them out like a chestnut from its shell. But I refuse to believe that somebody in the 1600s would just say, Oh yeah, she pops them out. Still, despite all of that, it is a very accessible book. Don't get me wrong about it. Despite the fact that I'm struggling to pronounce the names, when you're reading it, it kind of matters less, I think. And it's very easy to read. I mean, it's not a struggle at all. It's a pleasure to read. Another great bit of detail. So I mentioned that Greet's father is uh, blind. And because he's blind, his he feels his other senses more. And that's a particular problem during the winter. So it says here, being blind seemed to make my father hate winter even more. His other senses strengthened. He felt the cold acutely, smelled the stale air in the house, tasted the blandness of the vegetable stew more than my mother. He suffered when the winter was long. As somebody with sight, I think it's hard to imagine what it would be like to be blind and little details like that really bring it to life, I think. It's also interesting because uh, Greek can't read as well. So there are, you know, points where she's been giving messages to deliver and stuff, and she's not sure whether she's supposed to be able to read them or not, and she can maybe read one word. There's a point where she models for him and she's worried that he's gonna ask her to actually write something because he's getting her to hold a quill. And if he asks her to write something, she can't do it. She can't read, she can't write. She's not educated. There are so many great one-liners in this book, and this one in particular kind of, I think, uh, you know, summarises quite a lot of the plot in terms of the gossip and the intrigue in this really, really weird household. It's very different to what we know and, you know, come to expect from a household today. And this one line is, it was not a house where secrets could be kept easily. There's one moment as well where uh, Vermeer says that she's thinking too much and uh, so she closes her eyes and tries to meditate almost. But as she closes her eyes, again, she starts to notice her senses being heightened and she realizes that this must be what her father feels like in his blindness. There are also some interesting bits about color which you kind of would expect with a character like Vermeer who is, of course, an artist. And uh, Chevalier's depiction of Vermeer does feel, you know, it feels real to me, although I I'm not a huge Vermeer fan, I'm not a huge art lover, so I don't know whether perhaps there are things that she did get wrong. But what was interesting is they had this whole conversation about the different colours of things and how he paints things. He will add these false colours and then he'll paint on top of them. And it's because nothing is ever one colour. So it's, uh, so for example, clouds, people say they're white. Well, they're not. They've got bits of grey, they've got bits of blue, bits of black. Sometimes they've got reds and yellows and oranges in. So people don't necessarily see all of those subtle nuances and you get to see it as a reader through the way that Vermeer composes his paintings. It says, when at last he began to add colours on top of the false colours, I saw what he meant. He painted a light blue over the girl's skirt and it became a blue through which bits of black could be seen, darker in the shadow of the table, lighter closer to the window. To the wall areas he added yellow ochre through which some of the grey showed. It became a bright but not a white wall. When the light shone on the wall I discovered, it was not white but many colours. The pitcher and basin were the most complicated. They became yellow and brown and green and blue. They reflected the pattern of the rug, the girl's bodice, the blue cloth draped over the chair, everything but their true silver colour, and yet they looked as they should, like a pitcher in a basin. After that I could not stop looking at things. And what's interesting here is this kind of explosion of colours is contrasted by the blindness of her father. She actually describes the different paintings to her father when she goes back to uh, goes back to visit him. And, you know, he gets to the point where very little in life interests him except these descriptions of these paintings. And uh, I think Chevalier does a great job of... You, you see the vividness of the colours, and actually if you look at the cover of the book as well, you see that vividness there. I think pacing's great in it as well. I didn't have any problems with that. The dialogue, apart from that one little 
slip up on uh, popping them out, I guess. Other than that, I was very happy with it. After a while, Vermeer gets her to start grinding colours and he ta she takes on more of a role in helping him to produce the art. But at the same time, the other household help is, kind of turns a blind eye to it because the way they see it is she actually increases his output as an artist and they think if she can do that, it almost doesn't matter how she does it and what the societal norms are as, you know, she's a servant and he's an artist. There's a great point though where that's illustrated and she remembers the place so she gets asked to kind of step in to fill the pose of somebody else that she's going to be painting and she steps in and uh, he paints her for a little while and then he has this meeting and he forgets about her and she just continues to sit there still posing until his business associate is like, you, you should probably tell her to stop now. There's also a great point where she very slightly changes the layout of things in his studio. And bear in mind, as part of the reason that she was taken on was the fact that, you know, she wouldn't change these things. She'd put things exactly back how they were. And it's a change she makes that she feels will change the art for the better. And Vermeer actually agrees with it as well. And, uh kind of takes her as an equal. The colours are then referred to again because she's convinced that she's going to be sort of stopped from helping him and the big thing to her is that she would have to live life without the colours. I think colours are a very kind of key theme to this book. There's also a dirty old man, it's uh, Van Ruyven. I do not like Van Ruyven. He's kind of one of those creepy old geezers. He, he tries to cop a feel of her. He wants her to be in this painting that he's paying for. And even Vermeer's like, oh no, I don't want to do that. Also, he's a wealthy patron. I mean, when you, in those days, the artists needed the patrons as much as the patrons needed the artists. So, And of course, then there's finally a moment where she is actually asked to pose for a portrait. We kind of know this is going to happen all the way through because it's the girl with the pearl earring and because it's based on a real painting but it still is kind of a relief when finally uh, Vermeer you know asks her to model for him but what's funny is that this rumor spreads throughout town and she's actually one of the last people to find out about it that's kind of how innocent and, and almost naive she is she gets wolf whistled as well it says here when they saw me a chorus of high whistles erupted that made me want to stop my ears I went up to the nearest boy and asked him where my brother was. He turned red and ducked his head. What's interesting about that is that obviously highlights a problem with our own modern day society, but it's also crazy to think that something like that could have continued from the 17th century into the 21st century. We're still behaving like, you know, 17th century scallions. Scallions, is that a word? Hey Google, what's a rap scallion? Rap scallion, a mischievous person. That's what I was going for. I got a little note saying yay because the last sentence of one of the sections is just six simple words. He was going to paint me. And you can see here that the sections in this particular edition are separated by these really beautiful little drawings and uh, this edition as a whole was fantastic. I really enjoyed it, really enjoyed it. Another example of one of those great one-liners is this. My father chuckled, his good mood restored. He was always pleased to hear that a rich man could be a poor musician. There's also a kind of a continuing thing throughout as well that she doesn't want anyone to see her hair. And again, you can't even see it in the in the portrait really. Um, but there is a moment when somebody sees her hair and it's kind of considered to be a big deal. And again, I think that speaks very much of the time at which the book is set. Another great one-liner. Is it your back again? I tried to sound sympathetic, but Taneka's back always hurt. A maid's back would always hurt. That was a maid's life. There's also a point at which somebody wants to marry her and uh, he basically says, I've spoken to your father this morning and he has agreed that we may marry now you are 18. You can leave here and come to me today. And, she's, and she just replies, this is not the place to talk about such things. Not in the street like this. You are wrong to come here. And she has a point. She's not a thing. But this book kind of explores the fact that back then, I guess, women were considered things, especially if you were a maid as opposed to a noblewoman or, you know, a painter's wife. So that pretty much brings me up to the end of my notes. I don't want to go on for too long and I also don't want to reveal any spoilers by accident. What I will say is I very much enjoyed this book. I think it was a great little choice, a great surprise, because again, I just wouldn't have picked this up by myself. I wouldn't even have thought of it. And I was just really stoked to read it and it did not disappoint it was very good and for that reason i'm gonna give it five out of five stars this was incredible yeah you like just i mean you know no words you just need to read it it's beautiful it's it's got this kind of almost classical feel while still being kind of contemporary and again it mixes 
you know, the history uh, element of things with the art side of things, but equally it's just a biting commentary on our own kind of society today as well. And I am very happy with this and I encourage you to go out and read it. So anyway, that brings us to the end of this video. It's been kind of epic. I mean, it's been like a week or so in the making, but it's been enjoyable and I'm glad I did it. And I encourage you to check out Hannah Tay's Etsy store as well, if you haven't already. I'll put the link below. In the meantime, please do let me know with a comment whether you've read this book and if so, what you thought. If not, whether you plan to check it out anytime soon. And in the meantime, hit subscribe for more and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye.